Uh, for me, it started in 2007. That was the first time I heard about the Warburg effect. And uh, it was something I read on a blog, and I immediately thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. Um, and the next big milestone for me was about two and a half years ago when Dominic D'Agostino and Peter Rattia, who is uh, the founder of NUSI, the Nutrition Science Initiative, uh, he did that with Gary Taubes, they came to our offices and they basically told us about ketones and the role of fat, and it was one of those type of meetings where I look back today and I, I almost can't imagine my life prior to that because it seems so self-evident to me now, but at the time that was a really big revelation. Um, and then that meeting led me to one of the biggest mistakes of my life, which was uh, trying to read this book. <laughs> and for those of you that have tried, if you feel smart, if you're feeling really smart that day, I just cracked this thing open, you know, flipped through a couple of pages, and very quickly, I, you know, I'm put back in my place. Um, uh, there was something very, very interesting in the book. There was a lot of interesting things, most of which I didn't understand. The ones that I did was I realized that compliance was going to be the major challenge to getting this approach to actually do what we thought it could do. And I think chapter 17, uh, Tom Seafried made a plea for a ketogenic compliant Oreo. So we began in earnest and um, that was a kind of an interesting challenge. But compliance is something that is going to echo throughout everything and I think that's, that's really what the Keto Pet Sanctuary brings to the table is uh, an answer to that uh, problem. So for me personally, I really wanted to see if ketogenic diets are the single most important thing on the cancer landscape today. Um, and I think that I'm 19 months into the Keto Pet and I would definitively say I'm, I'm much more, uh, a little less naive, but a lot more convinced than I was back then. One of the reasons that I figured nobody would ever get to this question very quickly is that there's really no drug at the end of the rainbow. In this particular case, there's no secret molecule, there's no proprietary molecule that you're going to end up with. It's really just a diet. Uh, at least that's the central piece of it. Um, and there's really no funding for this. I remember Dominic telling me that they do a find and replace every time they submit to the NIH. If the word dietary or nutritional is in there, they get rid of it because they're not going to get any funding. Uh, and that, that's pretty sad. Uh, in the 50s, that wasn't the case. We used to do a lot of research in the U.S. that didn't really have a, a, an end goal to it, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So why a nutritional approach? This is a common question for us. Uh, it's not that we're somehow dogmatically attached to nutrition. I do think nutrition is vastly underappreciated, but in this particular case, I actually think it's the most powerful tool. Um, we have looked, obviously, at chemotherapeutics and a lot of things that are out there, uh, and they are very powerful in terms of their ability to generate side effects, uh, and they can be very useful. We're going to talk about that. Um, but I really do think that if you're going to really fix the cancer problem, there's so much going on. I mean, every time I see these slides with Krebs cycle, I mean, it's, it, it's incredible, the complexity of it. And the diet is doing something at a basic, basic fundamental level that we, we certainly aren't going to be able to replicate by outfiguring, you know, each of these little pathways in the, in the next uh, immediate future, in my opinion. Uh, and to me, kind of the gold standard for, uh, I guess, my litmus test for whether this was actually working was going to be a series of PET scans. When I first talked to a lot of the people that are in this room, I heard about these PET scans. I never seemed to see them, and I heard about these amazing stories and people going PET negative, and uh, that became kind of my, um, my threshold. Uh, so that's really what we set out to do. Uh, we also wanted to see one of the biggest things is, you know, a lot of these rat studies, um, they can get really deep into the information because you can sacrifice the animal and you can learn a lot about what's happening. One of the benefits of what we wanted to do is we wanted to do the opposite and see, hey, not only how long can we keep animals alive and can we get rid of these cancers, but can we show 10, 15 years down the road they never returned. So the big challenge, compliance. That, that's the, the overarching theme of everything. Uh, my particular solution was dogs. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they have a similar physiology. They're omnivores, so you don't have really the, the challenges of uh, a very different diet. Um, they have naturally occurring cancers, and we could get those. So rather than doing some sort of a, a really um, well thought out model, we'd just go into the real world, and what we did is we were going to go to kill shelters and recruit dogs that had naturally occurring cancers. Um, and dogs have one major advantage over human beings, really over, uh, really over human beings, and that is that they cannot do this. Um, any, any study that's done, um, it, when I talk to people, oh, we're doing a ketogenic diet study here, I know Adrian Sheck is doing some things, every single person is going to butt up against the fact that human beings make their own choices and you can't, you can't control them completely. So they have to be tricked. Dogs don't have to be tricked. We can actually just, hey, you know, get a piece of paper, write down what we want them to eat, and their compliance is absolute. 
The first step was putting a team together. A lot of the people are actually in this room. Um, you know, the first person that uh, I really talked to, I guess really the first person is uh, uh, Daniel Arego. Um, we base, both had the idea that, hey, this cancer thing is something that we don't have to look at decades down the, the road. A lot of the people uh, that I've heard speak today have a lot of patience. They, they really can move uh, these little uh, bricks into the wall and feel very satisfied with that. We wanted to see, can we short circuit the process? Um, the next person we talked to was Dr. Q, standing at the PET scan over there with me in the upper right. Dr. Q was the first person that really took dogs and applied ketogenic principles. He's got a really interesting personal story. His wife was diagnosed with glioblastoma, and he basically used dogs as a way to validate different approaches and then apply it to his wife. Um, and he, he is living the hero's tale in that he has, uh, his wife eventually ended up passing away from, from glioblastoma. Uh, the first time I spoke to him was about a week before that happening. Uh, we got an email from him saying, you know, um, my wife passed away. We assumed we wouldn't hear from him for a few months. A few days later, he said, I'm ready to go. He came for a two-day visit to California. He has not uh, since gone back, so that two-day visit turned into uh, two and a half, two years at this point. So um, Terry is a, uh, the Yoda of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and she has allowed us to do a part of our protocol we don't talk much about because it's handled so well. It's self-evident, but you'll see how, how intensive it really is. Um, and, and there's a lot of other people. We have a veterinarian here, I think the only veterinarian certainly in the room, who's helped us a lot do some very unorthodox things. And uh, the team is something I could go on and on, but they're always boring when, you know, when people are thanking people, so I'll, I'll jump to this. What is Keto Pet Sanctuary? It is a 53-acre ranch in Austin, Texas, uh, and we have our own pet CT. It's the only pet CT in the world, to my knowledge, uh, that just focuses on canines. So that was not an easy task to put together, as you can imagine. You have to have a radioactive materials license. We were, were originally from LA. We wanted to put it in LA. We ended up having to do it in Texas to get it done. We recruit dogs with cancer. We go to kill shelters and we say, hey, before you put that dog down, we would like an opportunity to cure it of cancer. And I love using that word because it scares people so much. Um, we do a calorically controlled ketogenic diet, and that's important. I think Tom Seafried made a good point. Calorically controlled is a big part of it. And one of the reasons that you do keto is that you can calorically control, at least as human beings. With dogs, even if, um, if they were on a high carb diet, which is a much harder diet to calorically control, we could pull it off because we have the compliance. Um, we marry that with hyperbaric oxygen, some other adjuncts that we'll talk about. And we have a 24 seven staff that is pampering these dogs you know, at two in the morning when they need something. Um, it's really a doggy playland with 100% compliance. So if you were to go there now, it doesn't seem like a cancer ward. It, these dogs look like they're having a lot of fun because there's a lot of human beings behind the scene making sure that they, they have a lot of fun. And we really deal with all types of cancers. Uh, we really haven't cherry picked anything. We take whatever we can get. Um, we, um, we'll, we'll talk about numbers as, as uh, the sludges talk more about the data piece. but. We deal a lot with hemangiosarcoma. Hemangiosarcoma is the number one killer of dogs. It's pretty universally accepted. It is a, um, it's an incurable cancer. We see that a lot. Mammary tumors, lymphomas, mast cell is another cancer that's pretty rare in humans, but, but quite common in dogs. Uh, and these all have a limited life expectancy. Um, and you can see some of the pictures here. We, you know, we've had some dogs whose tumors were probably almost half their body size. Uh, so you know, very, very advanced stages, as well as some early ones. And we do a lot of dietary manipulations. So we treat these dogs like bodybuilders. And I think that the one approach that we have that's a little bit different is we really take a look, we, we look at their body fat and we look at how do we turn this dog into a uh, high performance machine. Uh, we look at their blood ketones. We were doing those up to three times a day. We look at their blood glucose. We do all that and we have perfect records of that because they're, they're all in one facility. They're not all over the place. Uh, we do look at GI tolerance. This is our dog whisperer, Shannon, who happens to be my wife. Uh, she can make a dog eat anything that we want. So we say, hey, we want the uh, monounsaturated up. She'll find a way to trick them, whether it's butter, whether it's cream, whether it's Parmesan cheese to, to trick them. Uh, that's a big deal because we found that using a four to one ratio diet, the dogs develop an aversion and, and dogs have a really good sense of smell. So when we were using MCT oil, if once they developed the aversion, you, you couldn't get them to eat the food again. So we, um, we'll talk about the food, but that, that, that is a big thing that we've learned for, for, for even for dogs. So even though we do have compliance, they're all basically trapped there, we still have to play with the food quite a bit. Uh, and, and we've learned quite a bit about how to do that. This here um, is a PET scan, uh, three of them actually. So this is talking about metastasis, you know, jumping right to the punchline, which is gonna get backed up a little bit here. 
Uh, on the left, we have day zero. This is a four and a half year old um, Hungarian Vishla, which is a um, kind of like a Weimaraner, if you know what they look like, but brown, kind of really short hair. They, they, you know, they look really sleek, good runners. Uh, this was a dog that was a show dog. Her name is Callie. She was a four and a half year old Vishla that was pregnant. She was uh, used a breeder had her, and they, they expected maybe six pups. But when they ultrasound her, they only found one heartbeat. And they said, what the heck is the rest of this stuff? It was a huge tumor, which they cut out and they you know, uh, took out. And hemangiosarcoma, you know, depending what you read, I mean, you know, life expectancy is measured in, they were thinking maybe she had two months. So they wanted to try to uh, see if they could um, wean the pup before she passed away. We got her right after the pup was weaned. We put her on a ketogenic diet immediately. There were six sites, which you can see a heck of a lot better on the real software. The, the blow up really doesn't do it justice. 60 days later, uh, we took the second PET scan. There were three sites. And then 60 days after that, so 120 days later, she was down to zero. Um, and this was, a, this was the first dog we ever cured. We have since followed up. That was about, uh, we've been running for about 19 months, I think it is. And this was one of the first dogs. Uh, impressive, we followed up with, him, with um, ultrasounds. Um, because one thing we have learned is a couple of our cases, you can be pet negative and you can still pick it up on ultrasound. Um, and uh, so that, this was kind of the first success story. Um, we've since adopted her. We'll keep her for the next 20, 30 years. And you know, our goal would be to see, hey, th does this really keep it away? Because I think prophylactic use of the diet is probably the best use of a diet. Um, and if we find that our dogs uh, are able to keep this stuff at bay, then you know, we've shown something pretty interesting. Um, as far as the original tumor progression, I think you can put it in two camps. So we have um, dogs that we get fairly early and they have low tumor burden. In those cases, we can make them disappear often in 60 days. So we have a few dogs now that we've gotten pet negative to 60 days, uh, in 60 days, so two months, um, and they, they look great. And just recently, we've had a couple of these dogs that we said, hey, cure, we, we got them all going. And now they're starting to develop little hemangiosarcoma um, lesions on their, their paws and things. So the, the picture obviously is not answered yet. Um, but with low tumor burden, we see that quite often. When you have a big tumor burden, um, you've got situations where uh, a dog can, you know, you, you sometimes have bleeding and things like that. Uh, but other cases, this one here, this is Smoochie here on the bottom right. And she has had a, a chain of mammary tumors which are still palpatable. You can feel them, but they're pretty much frozen. Um, and she had a very high mitotic value, a very aggressive cancer that really has, you know, just stayed in a very frozen state. We could easily do a surgery and get uh, rid of that. Um, we were hoping that we could see, hey, let, let's see what happens over time. Will the diet gradually, bit by bit, make it go away? So that, that, that still happens to, uh, you know, we're still waiting to see on that. But the dog seems to be in every, you'd never know it by, by talking to her um, uh, or watching her play. Um, one other thing we've done is we started putting together keto and standard of care. So at the beginning, we were really interested in seeing, hey, let's look at hyperbaric oxygen. Let's look at the diet itself. Uh, we played with some other things like IV vitamin C, et cetera. Um, but you can see here, so in a couple of cases, the, the, I guess the most um, telling case was the first time we did it. We had a mast cell tumor, which had already lost one dog to mast cell. Uh, actually, we lost him to infection, which we'll talk about, not really the cancer. But we got a little nervous, and we started doing... Um, uh, a chemotherapeutic, which they said would take about eight to 12 weeks, and then we'd follow up with a secondary course of a different drug. Well, this dog, uh, his name was Buster, and he had a big tumor right here in, in his uh, left pec. After two weeks on the chemo, they said, wow, he's a surgical candidate. We don't need to run the full eight weeks or, or even the second drug. They cut it off, and, and that was kind of a success story. So that was the first use of it. The second one here, this is Rudy. Uh, Rudy had a big mast cell. Really, it looks much worse than you can see there with the cone on. And we used um, radiation with that as well as the ketogenic diet. And the, the biggest thing that we found at that time is they were surprised that he didn't lose any teeth and he didn't really have any uh, damage to the gums, which they say normally happens with radiation. Is that the diet? Really hard to say. My guess is yes. Um, but we just got a report actually today that um, he, he's doing very, very well and, and pretty much the, the, the nose area is cleaned up. So uh, we'll continue to watch him. Um, the main thing I think that uh, is potentially really interesting about this is the long-term um, use. This, this here is Callie. This is the dog that we saw the PET scans of. Uh, and she seems perfect. Um, uh, was really, you know, we talked to her vet afterwards 
And he said, why are we still talking about this dog? Didn't this dog pass away you know, months ago? Uh, and she's been with us, um, I'm gonna say about 18 months. Um, so she's sort of a superstar of the program. Uh, the most interesting thing will be if we're sitting here with a hemangiosarcoma, um, my, uh, Dr. Sludge will talk a little bit more about the, the long term, the longest they've ever seen, um, but they did, you know, 18 months is, is out of the question. We'll see over the next few years uh, what really happens to her. Uh, what are we going to do next? We're going to continue to tweak the diet. So we've learned a lot. In the early days, we used to do 120 days of 4 to 1. And we learned pretty quickly that we would get the dogs very lean and we, we titrate the calories very tightly to, um, to their body fat. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can add and, and you can still do a lot of playing with it. We now have gone to a 60 day window of four to one and then we dropped to a two to one. Uh, and we punch protein days in there based on what the dog look, looks like. Some dogs need huge amounts of calories just like humans and, and some dogs can, can subsist on very, very low calories. Uh, we're going to apply more synergistic components. I think this is probably the weakest uh, part of what we do. We haven't gotten very good at validating certain approaches, so we don't really know, hey, in this particular case, what is HBOT really doing? Um, what, if anything, did vitamin, IV vitamin C do? Um, and the specifics of the diets and, and things like that. Uh, we've now applied for 501c3 status, so up until this point, we just self-funded it ourselves. Um, it costs about $100,000 per dog, to give you an idea. Um, that's if you take the, the aggregate cost of running the facility and you divide it out by the number of dogs, uh, that, that's what it costs. So we could take way more dogs, except that you know, our pitch is pretty simple. You're about to kill that dog, why don't you give it to us? Uh, but that's been kind of strange. They know, they know how to fill out the paperwork to euthanize a dog, but to give a dog and put it in your care, you know, it took them a while to get through that. I know Terry has sweated. Um, for 18 months at this point, and now the floodgates are starting to open. But that's going to be a big deal because we'll actually start raising funds, something we've never done before now that we feel, okay, we've kind of proven it to this point, we can be doing a lot more. Um, if we self-finance, which we'll continue to do, we'll keep pushing it, but if we increase the amount of funds, obviously we, we can move faster. Um, and then really applying this to humans, that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the next uh, two presenters here. Uh, but we did solve the ketogenic Oreo problem. Um, you'll be able to eat those in, in the next uh, couple of months. Um, and, uh, you know, this is how we will transition from dogs to humans because with dogs, as I mentioned, we've got the full, um, uh, the compound, of, uh, you know, that we, we have these dogs housed in. With humans, you've got to get a lot trickier and you've got to actually do a lot more work from the ma manipulation angle. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. I got a strange phone call about two years ago. What do you know about Warburg and the ketogenic diet? And dogs. So um, what they'd done is they'd had a lot of conversations with um, Ron D'Agostino. Um, I got a bunch of books from Amazon delivered to my house. And um, the following week I got another interesting phone call. I want to do this in humans. So he said, but before I do it in the humans, we got to test it in the dogs first. He says, I need a hospital. I need people, and we've got to get this up and running. So what he was able to do is get a bunch of people together to say this is a great idea, build a veterinary hospital in Austin, and get rights to a CT PET scanner for animals. And that was done in 60 days. Um, so at that point, we scrambled to catch up. And then we had the great opportunity to say, you've got somewhat unlimited resources to do everything you possibly can to cure cancer in a dog. Now they chose the dogs because um, we had fairly strong stipulations from the pennas. One is you have to do naturally occurring cancers because we don't want to cause more cancer, we want to get rid of it. Two is you need a good surrogate outcome measure to make sure that what you're actually doing is going to be effective and we can measure that effect. Fortunately with dogs with a very high naturally occurring cancer rate, if we took dogs that had a terminal diagnosis, so dogs that are supposed to be dead within four to six months, if we can keep them alive longer than four to six months, then we can show efficacy of whatever we're doing. And we had no restrictions on the treatment. Diet had to be the foundation, but if something else looked like it was supposed to be effective, we were allowed to use that. This ran into some very interesting things. So, started with the ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen, metabolic conditioning program. The exercise component ended up being incredibly important. This is all very well documented because we wanted to take what we learned from the dogs and then be able to translate that to humans. So very quickly we were able to take benchtop research, translate it into a large animal model in preparation 
for translating it into a human clinical trial. Uh, it also ran into some fairly interesting situations. Vets aren't used to doing this. So we're treating the dogs as if they're humans. I'm a physician, I usually take care of people, so we treated them as if they were people. And uh, there's a great story, I, ho I hope Daniel's around here somewhere. He's with a dog in a veterinarian's office in Austin. And the vet gives him some advice. And Daniel turns to me and says, I want you to think about that advice carefully. If this dog were the President of the United States, what would you recommend? He says, well, if the dog were the President, I'd fly him down to Houston to see this oncology specialist who's down there to get his opinion. Daniel said, thank you very much. Can you give me his address? <laughs> Drove the dog to Houston, got the vet, and dog ended up having surgery as we were able to use that as adjunct care as we improved the dog's care. So these did not get your normal veterinarian care. This is human care for animals. So acceptance criteria, we had to have histology. We needed to know what tumors we were treating. They had to have positive PET scans so we could follow it with a surrogate marker. They had to also have a 12-week expect life expectancy because we wanted to get them at least through that portion of the study to try to determine their efficacy. It turned out that the dogs that we've enrolled in the study all meet these criteria. We did, however, for humanitarian reasons, take some dogs that we knew were not going to meet this criteria, and we had dogs pass away within the first week or two of us um, obtaining them, but it was really hard to turn down uh, offers to be able to take care of these dogs when that opportunity arose. The intervention of the diet, it's a raw food diet, four to one ratio. Um, we started 70-30 beef, MCT powder. Uh, we cycle the fats in it between creams, butter, and other fats. We realize we need to with the dogs, as Ron mentioned earlier, you have to cycle the food or the dogs get tired of it. This was a lesson we carried over to the humans. You have to cycle human food or they're gonna get very tired of it. We also learned as we moved through the diet that we had to add things back in that we hadn't thought about. We had to add in the fiber, we had to add in the minerals, we had to add in the vitamins. We had to get back into the prebiotics and the probiotics. So the combination of the three phases sort of work on the gut with the prebiotic, probiotic fibers, work with the diet and work with the metabolic conditioning, adjunct therapy for the HPOT, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery when it was, um, when it was appropriate. You have to also realize that most of these dogs came to us at the end of care. The vast majority had already had surgery and had already had adjunct therapy tried. Um, so it was either, you know, this dog has 30, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to live, um, or they can come down and spend time with us at the shelter. Hyperbaric oxygen, um, this is a very aggressive regimen. Um, this is incredibly time intensive, so it's a 60 minute time in the chamber, so it's almost about two hours for the dog um, because there's the pre-chamber, post-chamber time, three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off for the entire 120-day cycle. So it's a very aggressive uh, HBOT protocol, um, morphed out of what was done in uh, Dom D'Agostino's lab uh, with Angela. So outcome measures. We looked at two types, daily outcome measures for compliance with the diet. The dogs were measured with a um, activity scale every day, body habit scale every day, fat assessment every day, muscle uh, lean mass, PET scans 60 to 120, ultrasounds 30 and 60 in case we were missing something with the PET scans. So we're assessing them on a daily basis and on an incremental basis as they move through the program. Um, the body score was important to us in terms of their diet. The diet got manipulated on a regular basis based upon how much the dog weighed, what its activity was, how sick it was, what its lean mass looked like as we played with the macronutrients to try to um, keep a stable weight within the dogs. Um, the calories varied, uh, I think there's a slide later, between 11 and 39. So uh, I agree with comments earlier, calorie restriction is an unusual comment. We were basically looking at uh, ideal body mass, lean body mass for the dogs. Uh, careful accounting of the adverse events, because once again, for us, this is a precursor trial moving into uh, human clinical trials. So what we wanted to show today really is based on the first 15 dogs that have completed a 120-day cycle that are now out at least six to eight weeks beyond that 120 days to see if there are any complications once we stopped the HBOT um, and they're continuing on a regular two-to-one ketogenic diet. So this one slide sort of surmises the entire talk and the importance of the information we gathered from it. 15 dogs completed at 170 to 300 and 400 days, you can see we have 12 dogs still alive. Based upon the life expectancy of the tumors that they had, we should have zero survivorship. So we've got 12 out of 15. We did have three dogs pass away. 
Two died of angiosarcoma who died of the cancer, of the disease, metastatic complications from the disease. The one dog with mast cell actually died of um, a systemic uh, infection. He had a rapid tumor kill, ended up with central necrosis of his tumor, uh, developed a secondary infection, and died of the sepsis. So at the completion of it, we have five that are PET scan, CT scan negative, which means we cannot detect tumor within the animal. We have two um, that are in remission. This is because of hematological tumors. And we have five that have stable cancer, which means um, their cancer is not growing and has shrunk. Um, and are still running around leading healthy lives without progression of the tumor, though we can still find uh, residual on CT PET scanning. Glucose and ketones, our target range, what we're actually able to determine, it shows that with the dogs, we could get pretty close to the glucose measurement, but we had a hard time with the ketones. Really difficult to get a dog's ketones up. Um, you'll see data later. This is sort of the reverse of what we found in the humans where it's much easier to drive their ketones up and much harder to drive their glucose down. Um, weight loss was not a predictor of outcome. So there's a lot of talk about uh, calorie restricted, non-calorie restricted, 30% reduction, 20% reduction. What we did is the dogs that came in skinny, we tried to get on optimal body weight with dietary manipulation. The dogs that came in heavy, we limited or manipulated their macronutrients to try to get them to an ideal body weight. But once the animals reached those, we tried to keep all animals as close as we could to their ideal body weights. Um, but the bottom line is we couldn't find a difference um, in terms of weight loss or calories based upon the markers that we were following. The issues that we had. Um, Fatty livers, we found that once we started to cycle the fat sources, um, we didn't have nearly the problem with fatty livers. It's still something we're concerned about and we continue to watch. The initial body mass, because we started with a uh, fast, uh, and it turns out that with the fast, not only are they losing the fat that we want them to lose, they're also losing too much lean body mass. On the four to one diet, before we were pulse dosing them with uh, protein, we also had more lean body mass than we, were, uh, than we wanted. We had GI issues um, that we helped solve and ameliorate with the fiber and the prebiotics and probiotics. Coprophagia early on was a problem uh, with dogs because they weren't getting enough fiber and they weren't getting enough minerals and this is a place for them to find them. Uh, we did not have that problem in the human study. Um, and <laughs> the comorbid factors, um, these dogs came in very sick. So uh, a lot of them had heartworm, most of them had comorbid uh, metabolic diseases that we had to manage either along with uh, the management of the cancer or in some of the dogs that took precedence in their survivorship. Um, but the curiosity was that with all these comorbid factors, at first we were thought it was going to be a complication to the study, uh, but what it did is it gave us great insight as we transitioned this to the human study in terms of what the ketogenic does to the metabolic diseases. Uh, and I'll let more be said about that in the follow-up. So in conclusion, it's got profound effect um, on cancer survivorship. So we should have had a 100% fatality rate, uh, and we still have 12 dogs alive uh, two months after the completion of the 120-day protocol. It's difficult to achieve. This was a high-touch process with the animals. Um, there is a tremendous amount of involvement of the people at the Keto Pet Sanctuary to manage and maintain these dogs. Uh, implication for humans, one is the tolerability. Can we get humans to follow a ketogenic diet? Is it sustainable? Once they try it, will they continue to take it uh, as long as is needed? The dogs were 120 days. And how to avoid the unintended consequences, particularly of the protein malnutrition and the fatty liver? And with that, I'll pass it on. All right, I know we have, time is getting short, so I'm gonna take just a couple minutes to tell you about our initial pilot study that we did on uh, some patients uh, in Louisiana. So we did uh, a pilot uh, looking at a meal delivery system that we had developed uh, along with Quest Nutrition to, de to deliver meals to patients' houses. And you know, I say this is a pilot study, but actually it was a very advanced, difficult study because we did it in South Louisiana, where life revolves around food, and you have you know, crawfish etouffee battling with your four to one ketogenic diet. But anyway, we took it on in Lafayette, and we really, there were sort of four pillars to the study. The, the first ma major thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to look at, you know, could we deliver these meals to the people's houses 
Um, the meals were at that point fresh meals. Um, and you know, was it feasible to keep people on that? And then we wanted to get their feedback on the meal so that we could then improve them before we roll this out to cancer patients. Uh, then we wanted to see not only could they comply with the meals, but could they do the measurements daily of their blood glucose and ketones and report them to, the, to us and we could see what kind of compliance we had with that. And then would we have any impact on their other cardiometabolic factors. So what we did was a six week meal delivery program with also snacks. We had crackers, bars, peanut butter, mint cups, and the food was pretty delicious. Uh, John and I went on it as well with the patients. We started out with a four to one diet. We had planned to do this for six weeks, and then we found with the, with the humans the same issue that we had with the dogs, which is that they started to develop some serious food aversions, and they just had GI distress, really hard time to tolerating the four to one diet. So we upped the protein a little bit, lowered the fat for the last three weeks, and that seemed to help people to continue to stay on the diet. So we, you know, a big white box would be delivered to their house every week, and it wasn't in the white box, they weren't allowed to eat it. And they were pretty good at sticking with it. We also added a metabolic conditioning program after they'd keto adapted. We wanted to see if we were able to do that, get people to completely change their diet and start an exercise program. And as I said, we did the twice daily blood measures, daily weights and blood pressures, and then they did a daily meal log and feedback to help us um, evolve the meal program. And we hired a health coach to go visit these people at home, check that what they were reporting was actually what was being measured on their monitors. Uh, they did weekly phone calls. We had them come in and do sort of a group meeting every other week. And then we did some extensive cardiometabolic labs um, in conjunction with a cardiology consultant that we hired for the study. So who were these people? Well, we had uh, three males and eight, eight women. They ranged in age from 26 to 65. For the most part, they were overweight to obese. We had uh, three diabetics, one pre-diabetic and uh, we had a couple with high cholesterol and high blood pressure. This is their average ketone readings over six weeks. You see they were able to get them up pretty well by week two and keep them up straight across. Now, this was not a calorie restricted diet. So we let them eat, you know, the, they had plenty of calories in that white box. They just couldn't deviate out of the white box, but we didn't try to calorie restrict them. It wasn't, you know, with the intended purpose of weight loss or anything. So they still got their ketones up pretty well. And they had pretty significant change in weight over six weeks. Um, some drop in the morning glucose, particularly very much so in the diabetics. We had one type two diabetic that started out uh, around 230 for a fasting glucose. No, 280 was his fasting glucose. He was horrible control. And then by the end of the study, he was routinely in the 100 to 110 range. This is, uh, you know, with no medication. We had another type two who um, was had to, you know, we got him completely off insulin by week two and then significantly drops his meds. We had to then drop his ACE inhibitor. He had a big drop in his blood pressure as well. So our average change in the diabetics was a 4% drop in the hemoglobin A1C. We didn't see any significant changes in, in cholesterol and th ditto with HDL, LDL, nothing really. We didn't have anybody that had that significant rise in LDL in this group. Uh, one of our, we did have one type, type 1 diabetic that was in the study, and she ended up um, having to drop out after the third week because she got a lot of, she got some allergic reaction or intolerance. She basically ended up with like an inflammatory bowel disease flare. Uh, but, but this was um, her data from, she had an implantable glucose monitor. So this is the top tracing is the week before she went on the diet. And she, this is someone with a hemoglobin A1C in the high sixes. So she's not like a terribly controlled type 1. Uh, and then this is from the first week on the diet. But I will say that I don't know that we could have done it without Andrew's help trying to manage her because it was terrifying to take care of this woman. Uh, you know, she was, she was getting extremely hypoglycemic at night, uh, you know, and her, her monitor was going off all night long and, you know, we were trying to, to, to manage her and it was, it was really downright frightening. I don't know that I would want to take on that challenge again anytime soon. So the 4% the, the drop in the hemoglobin A1C is pretty significant. You know, we had this big UK PDS study showing that um, in patients who dropped their, their hemoglobin A1C even 1%, that translated to a 21% downstream decrease in uh, complications from diabetes. So pretty significant in just six weeks. 
So just to close, when you think back to the four pillars that we, that we tackled, um, you know, the first was, could we do this meal delivery and get the feedback on it? Yes, we could do it. We got a lot of feedback, which led us to modify the meals. We now are in the process of developing a frozen meal delivery program that will launch in a few weeks and that we're going to roll out in a big way to cancer patients um, and do some significant studies there. So we were able to do that. We were able to get them to comply. We were able to do the, um, the blood glucose monitors. So I think you know, this was definitely a successful thing. We want to now translate what we had done in the dogs and do that in a, in a big way in the humans. So that's our plan for this spring. So stay tuned. I think a year from now we'll have some data to show you in the human population with the meal delivery program. Thank you. Cancer 
the choice of their drink is between the beer water. And in nature, somehow, we believe they have this sense of drinking rainwater, which is between the beer water when they are sick. So this is a very natural process, and I praise your work just connecting with these uh, already established treatments to some biochemical uh, mechanisms that we are, we, are, we are clarifying now. And it really nicely connects to all this. I just want to add this in the Appreciate that, Dan. As you guys are big thinkers and big dreamers, if you solve a green scenario for five years, how it's been on the big moment, and going by what you see happen on a daily basis and how you come up with it here, what would you anticipate in five years? Thank you. 
possible for some of them to have secrets and say, hey, let's, just, let's see what we can do about not only helping you keep your consumer at bay, but also maybe getting you off into this. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, we have a home run with these kids, and we're looking for a home run. Challenge is finding that sweet spot where you've got someone that's a high risk, so you've got a lot of uncle law positives there. But you've also got another marker to show that not just the uncle law is going negative, but some other marker, and yet the person is not at a point where they're going to be treated for cancer. So it's such that you, you're really catching people so early, but yet with some kind of marker that you've involved. It's hard. CA 125 and PSA might be the two best options you have because those are used for screening in general. And you really pick up this. Is nice for us too, because so, we want to make that transition. Dr. Safri shows that slide, the number of diagnoses and the number of treatments, and he usually circles way over on the right, the death rate. What we'd like to see is that slide change, but not on the right hand column. We'd like to see it change all the way up on the left hand column. Yeah. What Dr. Chan talked about, so instead of talking about how we treat this bad cancer, which you have it, which we're trying to do with the dogs, is how do we prevent it from starting in the first place, or how do we get rid of it with that early infection? Very provocative studies. Um, there's a new revelation in cancer um, treatment that uh, traditional chemotherapy, radiations, um, and also to a certain extent surgery can somehow cause the immune system. So um, in your dog cohort and in the human cohort, I'm just wondering um, uh, what are their immune cells um, status is like. Um, so in humans, in the cohort in humans, uh, one of my questions is um, what about the susceptibility to flu in flu season in those 10 cohorts? Um, um, if any of them develop flu um, or um, if it or if it's fine, I know that I think it's low, but um, from the immune cell, how did they do? How do the dogs do? How did they do this? Dogs. I, I wasn't there at KPS on a day-to-day -day basis, but fortunately we have pets here. Any, any problems with the dogs don't get colds the same way we do, but any, any change in the dogs in the day-to-day -day in their immune systems you could notice? Not that I know about. I mean, there is dog flu and there's a new strain of dog flu that came out last May. The original strain mutated from horses in Florida, from the racing horses to the racing greyhounds. And that strain of dog flu has been around for, since 2005. But last year, a new strain showed up. And so that strain, so that now there's two strains of dog flu, but we haven't seen any in KPS. And in the human trial, uh, the two months ended in November, so that most of those patients opted to stay keto that were in our initial, initial trial. Um, but I mean, the number's too small and too short to really give any sort of assessment on what the ketogenic diet would have had an effect you. But in the immunology terms of the cancer is, is enormous as a potential adjunct therapy. What I didn't add in there is there was an outbreak of dog flu, the new strain, in Central Texas. Like during last spring, summer, there was an outbreak in other places in the United States. But just Recently, just before Christmas, there was an outbreak in Central Texas. So we're knocking on wood that we don't see it still. Yeah. It, it would be interesting in the end, in the end, to see whether you're changing the effects of your new response. In some of those studies, if you're an immunologist, you don't want to find that hard to do. You basically get blood, you can run full cytometry, and you can look at some of these markers, and somebody knows more about it. It didn't make more comments, but it'd be interesting to see if you're, if you're actually increasing the anti-tumor in your response. I will wrap with this as I'm sure it's into a Friday course. If you have anything that you think you should be considering, let us know. You can reach the Keto Pet Sanctuary, just look it up. Uh, we are super open. We've made so many contacts at this uh, particular meeting that there's probably other things we should be looking at, anything we should be doing to help validate. We'd be very open to that, so appreciate it.